Welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. Today I'm going to be doing a podcast titled Brain Circuitry That Causes Dissociative Experiences. As usual, when I read an article on the sciences or foundations for wellness, those are my playlists. I'll put a link into the description, and I might stop and make a comment or two here and there. But mostly, I'll read through it. This is from Big Think. It's titled, Scientists Uncover the Brain Circuitry That Causes Mysterious Disassociative Experiences. A team of researchers have discovered the brain rhythmic activity that can split us from reality. By Molly Hansen. I was also intrigued on this topic, and a friend of mine had made a comment that they um, suffer from this. I thought it'd be something I'd push up the list. And it's an interesting thing. I'll talk about the points now. Researchers have identified the key rhythmic brain activity that triggers a bizarre experience called disassociation, in which people can feel detached from their identity and environment. This phenomena is experienced by about 2% to 10% of the population. Nearly 3 out of 4 individuals who have experienced a traumatic event will slip into a disassociative state either during the event or sometimes after. That's interesting. I've had a couple of traumatic experiences. Um, the finding implicate a specific protein in a certain set of cells as key to the feeling of dissociation. And it could lead to better targeted therapies for conditions which disassociation can occur. That's interesting. We're going to get some, hopefully, hope in the future. A team of Stanford researchers have identified the key rhythmic trainer that triggers a mysterious and often written experience called. Uh, okay, I read that already. Oopsie. So, this article will have links and videos. Some even have an audio portion where you can listen and. Maybe get someone who can pronounce the words properly. <clears throat> anyway, I'll continue. What is disassociation? Disassociation is an experience commonly described as a feeling of sudden detachment from the individual's identity and environment, almost like an out-of-body experience. This mysterious phenomena is experienced by about 2-10% to 10 of the population. This state often manifests as the perception of being on the outside looking in at the cockpit of a plane that's your body or mind. And what you're seeing, you just don't consider to be yourself, explained senior author Carl Dizeroth, MD, PhD, in a Stanford Medical News release. And that's highlighted, so it's a link. Dizeroth is a professor of bioengineering and of psychiatry and behavioral sciences, as well as a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. Nearly three quarters of individuals who have experienced a traumatic event will slip into a disassociative state either during the event or in the hours or even weeks that follow, according to Dizeroff, or Dizeroff. Most of the time, the disassociative experience ends on their own within a few weeks of the trauma. But the eerie experience can become chronic, such as in cases of post-traumatic stress disorder and extremely disruptive in daily life. The state of disassociation can also occur in epilepsy and invoked by certain drugs. Yowzer. Until now, no one has known what exactly is going on inside the brain triggering and sustaining these feelings of dissociation. And so, it has been a challenge to figure out how to stop it and develop effective treatments. Interesting. Uh oh. Blooper alert. I hit the fucking wrong thing. Alright, so I got lost a little bit. I hit the. <laughs> uh. That's funny. Alright. Last week, in a study published in Nature, Dizer Ross and his colleagues at Stanford University uncovered a localized brain rhythm 
and molecule that underlies this state. The study has identified brain circuitry that plays a role in well-defined subjective experience, says Dizero. Beyond this potential medical implication, it gets at the question, what is the self? That's a big one in law and literature, and important even for our own introspection. The author's findings implicate a specific protein existing in a particular set of cells as key to the feeling of disassociation. The research team first used a technique called wide-field calcium imaging to record brain-wide neuronal activity in lab mice. They observed and analyzed changes in those brain rhythms after the animal had been administered a range of drugs that are known to cause disassociative states. Ketamine, benzlidine, <laughs> and disaspline. At a certain doses of ketamine, the mice behaved in a way that suggested that they were likely experiencing disassociation. For example, when the animals were placed on an uncomfortably warm surfaces, they reacted to it by flicking their paws. However, they signaled that they didn't care enough about the unpleasantness to do what they would typically do in such a situation, which is to lick their paws to cool them off. This suggested a disassociation from the surrounding environment. Mm -hmm. The drug produced oscillations in neuronal activity in regions of the mice's brain called the retrosplenial cortex an area essential to various cognitive functions such as navigation and episodic memory, parentheses, a unique memory of a specific event. The oscillations occurred at about 1 to 3 hertz, 3 times or 3 cycles per second. The authors then examined the active cells in more detail by using two photon imaging for higher resolution. This revealed that the oscillations were occurring only in layer 5 of the retrosplenial cortex. Next, the researchers recorded neuronal activity across other regions of the brain. Interesting. I love neuroscience. Normally, other parts of the cortex and subcortex are functionally connected to neuronal activity in retrosplenial cortex. Ken Salt of, oh boy, Oluwasian Akeju wrote in Nature. However, ketamine caused a disconnect such that many of those brain regions, or many of these brain regions, no longer communicated with the retrosplenial cortex. The scientists then used optogenetics as a method of manipulating living tissue with light to control neural function, to stimulate neurons in the mice's retrosplenial cortex. When the scientists did this at 2 Hz rhythm, they were able to cause disassociative behavior in the animals, analogous to the behavior caused by ketamine without using drugs. Well, that's insane. The experiments conducted by the team displayed how a particular type of protein, an ion channel, was essential to the generation of the Hertz signal that caused the disassociative behavior in mice. Scientists are hopeful that this protein could be a potential treatment target in the future. Well, that's amazing. Um, fascinating. Hopeful. I'll continue. What about humans? The researchers also recorded electrical activity from brain regions in an epilepsy patient who had reported experiencing disassociation immediately before each seizure. The sensations experienced right before a seizure is called an aura. This aura for the patient was like being outside the pilot's chair looking at, but not controlling the gauges, Desiro said. Desiro, whatever. Sorry. The researchers recorded electrical signals from the patient's cerebral cortex and stimulated it electrically, aiming to identify the origin point of the seizures. While that was happening, the patient recorded, uh, responded to questions about how it felt. The authors found that whether the patient was about to have a seizure, or whenever the patient was about to have a seizure, it was preceded by the disassociative aura and a particular pattern of electrically activated localized within the patient's post uh, posteromedial cortex. <laughs> oh, shit. 
That pattern activity was characterized by an oscillating signal sparked by nerve cells firing in coordination at 3 Hz. When this region of the brain was simulated electric- electrically, the patient experienced disassociation without having a seizure. Wow, that's fucking nuts. Besides my fucking bad pronunciations. This study will have far-reaching implications for neuroscience and could lead to better targeted therapies for disorders in which disassociation can be triggered, such as PTSD, PTSD, borderline personality, and epilepsy. I think that's awesome. For one, you have the test on the mice. And that's a, in a lot of these articles, that's where the focus lies and then where it ends. And a lot of times you're looking at what's coming next. And it takes a long time. I don't remember this being in the only my stage, although I could be confused on that. But I'm glad to see that there is aspects of this applied to humans. Which means it would be closer in terms of, can it be useful? Can this information, can this research be useful? Now, I've never experienced this in a prolonged aspect. I would say maybe three times in my life I've experienced it. Pretty short. Maybe the first time when I was real, real young. It, hmm... Memory is a tricky thing, but let's say it was more scary of a thing. But getting older, like I said, by the time I'm 16, I'm um, really deep into learning about psychiatry and meditation, and I I quickly gather tools and resources to you know get a grip on things. But for people who I recommend meditating and um, certain techniques you you use in uh, breathing exercises and meditation, you could see this as being a scary thing, something they don't, they're not comfortable with. And in a way, I would uh, call back to one of the podcasts I did for four breathing techniques. And one of the four breathing techniques was a focus word breathing. So if I had a friend who is uh, suffering from this, but was really trying to gather, get together with a breathing technique and meditation that works for them, I would recommend a focused word breathing technique where it keeps you rooted and it's like a mantra. However, when you work with people, and I'm not a professional, I have no degrees, uh, but I work with enough friends and family and friends of friends of family, and sometimes a couple of people online, where I try to just be a friend and offer some input on what I kind of know in my 49 years. New techniques, new research can shed light and can really be a beacon of hope. You can't um, look at things uh, in a certain way and be oblivious to the facts like, okay, if this didn't have a human portion, like, what does it mean? Let's wait another five or ten years. And so, again, I'll go back to the point that there is a little bit of this research being done on humans and what it means. Can we get close? Can we target these areas? Can we learn more? Can we help people not suffer from this? I might be in that category where it happened two or three times in my life, and they were key to specific events. But to go through life and it become chronic... I can see the real um, worry in that. And I think getting more research, there's plenty of um, opportunities now with greater imaging technology. Neuroscience is growing fast, coupled with um, evolutionary biology and psychology. I think we're rapidly approaching a place where we're going to be able to work things out and give people some tools and even cures for some of the cognitive disorders and just the fuck-ups we have as humans. It's just not even to get technical with certain language, but you know we're all trying to get by in this world. 
like my article, I read another article. It was basically you never shut off your brain. It's like never shutting off. Some of us are packed in cities. Some of us feel lonely around people. This is just we're so varied, and so different. If we could just start helping underlying factors, making people more mentally stable or healthy, I think it it builds that momentum to really make change. I hope people enjoy this. Uh, it's from a Big Think website. It was by Molly Hansen. I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, all my information's in the description. I'm Joseph F. Olsis, Addiction Master on most social media. And my best to you and yours.